panelists uh, today share a lot of characteristics. They all have GSV as a partner and an, an investor. They are all entrepreneurs who have founded companies based on their passions to address really big challenges in the US educational system. And they are all, as I'm sure you will find out shortly, not only people with incredibly diverse and fascinating backgrounds, but in fact, relentless optimists. So we'll hear from them in just a second. You'll have the pleasure of getting to know them a little bit. But let me just frame this up uh, a little for you first. So we're here at the beginning of a new decade, 2020. And so it's a great time to think back about our accomplishments in the last decade, what we hope to achieve in this coming decade. And if you go back just 10 years at the beginning of 2010, it was a very different time for those of us in ed tech. And I think many people in this room were in ed tech 10 years ago. And uh, Deborah and Michael were planning the very first ASU GSV Summit, probably for fewer people than are in this room uh, right now. And there was optimism about this would be the decade that we'll actually be able to apply technology because of broadband, because of access to every student in ways that help us really make a difference in some of the um, biggest challenges that we have in, in US education. And we should attract a lot of capital into this market. We'll attract entrepreneurs who want to start up businesses. It's going to be a totally game-changing decade. So here we are at the beginning of 2020. How have we done? Well, um, there are probably more than 10 times as many companies uh, in the ed tech sector as there were 10 years ago. The summit is a huge must-attend event for 5,000 ed tech sta stakeholders uh, reflecting uh, a continued appetite and interest in making a difference in this sector. And investors have, by and large, done anywhere from good to great uh, in their investments in ed tech. Um, all these companies were started in the past uh, decade as well. So how have we done against those big goals? So in K-12, we had major achievement gap challenges we hope to address. Uh, Double-digit achievement gaps between white kids, African-American kids, Hispanic kids. If you look at income inequality gaps, even uh, higher between low income and higher income uh, families. In higher education, we had unacceptably low graduation rates, only 39% in four years, 58% in six years. Uh, there were aspirations that that could be dramatically improved. We have a lot more college graduates here in the US. And in workforce, there was a huge mismatch between companies who were not able to hire people with the skills that they needed for their jobs, and over 8 million people unemployed in 2010, and many more who were uh, basically underemployed, not able to apply their skills uh, to the jobs that they wanted to have. So how did we do uh, in the last 10 years? Well, on the investment side, on the capital side, I think we've done very well. How about against those goals? So in K-12, uh, the achievement gap um, by race and ethnicity, did it get better by 70%, 60%, 50% closing that gap? Probably about 3 to 5% uh, improvement from 2010 to 2020. Zero percent improvement with income inequality achievement gaps. And in 20 states, they've gotten worse. In higher ed, uh, the graduation rate uh, in six years went from 58% to go to 70, 75% higher, like many were projecting and hoping. No, we got to 60%. And in workforce, uh, did we close all those uh, underemployment problems and those skills gaps? Uh, as everybody here, I think, knows, they're uh, worse than ever. 83% of employers uh, report significant problems in being able to hire the people that they want. Only 6% think universities are preparing their students uh, to be uh, collaborators and critical uh, uh, thinkers. And the number of underemployed and part-time uh, workers in the country who want to be full-time employed has risen to an all-time high of 22 million. Now, I even made up two of those data points, um, but uh, I won't tell you which ones. Jamie, Jamie Marisotis is, uh, I'm sure he knows the right answers to all that, but uh, I think that the themes are so clear and obvious that we're not hitting those big, hairy goals, and will it be this next decade that allow us to do that? And so we've got some relentless optimists here uh, on stage 
who are going to talk about how their companies and uh, their teams are working to really uh, solve and address these problems and what might need to be different, why it could be different in the next decade. But to get to know them a little bit better, I thought we'd start. And you know the backgrounds of these folks, and I encourage you to read their bios, are totally fascinating. They could do anything. They could work in any industry. But they've chosen this really challenging one. Uh, and so let's just start here with John. Uh, you can talk a little bit about your background. But uh, why ed tech? What, uh, uh, what uh, uh, attracted you to it? Yeah. So I think um, for me, it was relatively easy to, to find this path. I've always been able, um, and I think fortunate, to follow the things that um, I've been really passionate about. Uh, so I was a dancer growing up. I started dancing when I was three, um, fell in love with the arts, dance, music, theater, um, really was, was interested and passionate about education, went to public school that didn't necessarily have uh, really good arts education, but was a, a good, well-rounded school, um, and kind of had a really good balance growing up between creative education, good public school uh, in Massachusetts, um, and kind of was passionate, I think, about, about both. Um, and then, you know, danced professionally for a little while. Um, all of my friends are incredibly talented, world-renowned Broadway performers, directors, uh, top choreographers. Um, but I was probably the only one of them, <clears throat> I think, who was a little bit more interested in business and tackling really big problems and challenges in education. Um, so I took a little bit of a, of a curve. I went to law school, which is one of the least creative places, I think, in the world, um, which I found just to be really interesting um, and, and a great educational edu uh, experience. Um, practiced law for a little, a little while and then realized, you know, I kind of always knew I wanted to spend my life working uh, in creativity. I think in Michael Moe's presentation, one of the seven C's is creativity. I think it's one of the most important skills to teach uh, kids. They can learn creativity most when they're young. I think a lot of adults think they're not creative. Um, they can be creative, but it's a lot harder, I think, when you're an adult to learn creativity and develop those skills. And kids have an active imagination. It's really easy to foster creativity in, in kids. So I've always really been passionate about the arts, education, creativity. Um, I had a really active imagination growing up, so it was just easy for me to sort of uh, imagine how it could be different, I think, for uh, whether it's public school, um, after school programs, things like that. Um, so while I was in law school, uh, to, as a creative exercise, we started thinking about how could we change and transform arts education, because uh, law school is relatively boring, so I needed something to do, I think, on the side. Um, and we looked at arts educa education, it really hadn't changed in some forms of the arts in hundreds of years. The ways that uh, teachers are teaching students, um, and nobody had really leveraged technology to say, um, not how can we change arts education, because uh, we still really rely on teachers in the school working with kids. Um, I think that's the best environment for arts education. Um, but for us, it was how can we bring technology to the arts to make arts education more accessible and affordable for um, specifically K-12 schools, but really any institution where there are teachers and students working in the arts. Um, so my last year of law school, we started Artful, um, which is an online platform for arts education. Uh, we start the platform for K-12 schools completely free. The first thing we do is try to help teachers be more effective, um, be more inspired. Um, I taught dance for a while, and I know that's it's as a teacher, as probably a lot of you guys know, if you're not feeling inspired or creative, it's really hard to teach. Um, so we really, the whole company was started um, by sort of taking everything I was interested and passionate about and blending it together, um, and also saying, how can we use arts education as a vehicle in schools? Uh, it's less important to teach them the steps and the creativity, whether it's dance or theater or music. Um, really, what they're learning is collaboration, teamwork, creativity, um, all the skills that no matter what they want to do in their life, I think are incredibly important. Um, so I'm just, you know, I think it's a lot of my friends who are lawyers, it's really, it's tough. They're not passionate about it. Um, but I think for me, it was just really easy to follow the things I was passionate about um, and sort of think creatively of how can we solve a really big problem of making arts education more prevalent uh, in K-12 schools yeah. and helping teachers and students be more, more creative. Thanks, John. Taylor, you and your co-founders of Tucan, um, probably could have done anything given the successes that you'd had previously. What attracted you to education technology? Yeah, two things. So on the personal side, um, I got really good grades in school. Basically an A minus wasn't an A, considered as an A to my parents. Um, ended up getting a full ride academic scholarship to an amazing university, Cornell. But thinking back to all those years, what did I actually remember and retain? Like even just thinking about one subject level, Spanish, 
kindergarten through eighth grade, nine years of my life, I took Spanish. And all I remember is, donde esta la biblioteca? <laughs> like, why was I taught where's the library? And why is that the only thing I remember from all of those years? Um, so that kind of from the personal side, but then also our career journey. So me and my co-founders built some of the best consumer tech companies in Los Angeles. But we learned from those years, it is really hard to get anyone to do anything. Um, and we heard the, the concept of time and not having enough time in a day. Um, people have work, school, family, friends, gym, Netflix, Spotify, Facebook, Instagram, everyone's competing for your time. And so we actually thought we had a really interesting perspective like, why don't we flip it on its head instead and meet people where they already are throughout their day instead of asking them to create an entirely new habit. Um, so those two things we thought we could provide an inter interesting perspective to actually get people to learn. Yeah. Um, did anybody here have kids who've learned to code using Tinker? Is that, uh, oh, sorry, Krishna. I <laughs> thought uh, <laughs> we'd get, uh, well, tens of thousands of kids uh, have. And can you talk a little bit about your voyage to uh, entering yeah. that K-12 so, world? Thanks and good morning. So just to introduce Tinker, um, we provide tools, apps, gamified content for K-12 students to learn coding at home or at school. We provide lots of resources for teachers as well to teach coding even if, and integrate with other subjects as well. So that's Tinker. Uh, millions of kids and thousands of teachers use it every month. Uh, from a journey perspective, and I've done this as a project for my own kids. I have two kids, a boy and a girl, when they were like seven and five. Um, the second belief I have is that what math was for last century, computing is this century, and we all know why we teach math in schools. Um, and a personal level, you know, I came from a rural India, built two tech companies, uh, I co-founded two tech companies in Silicon Valley. I think tech is a great equalizer, and I have a serious passion for it. I know how to code, and I know all the, uh, you know, our engineers know how to code. We're all parents. So we're driven by the passion to make it, like, fun and intuitive, like, not just, like, and, you know, every time you think about coding, people think about jobs, I think about this tool that they can, it's just a life skill that kids can learn. Yeah. That's what it is. Um, Harriet, you've had, I think, one of the more interesting pathways to ed tech because you come out of sort of uh, media marketing. You were the head of marketing for Oprah for a long time. Um, education, very interesting shift. Mm -hmm. uh, what were you thinking about as you made that change? Well, you know, I, I look at television and what we did for 25 years as a creative endeavor. And I was lucky enough to be involved in something that had purpose at the same time that it was fun and profitable and all that. And there aren't very many opportunities to do things that really have a purpose. So as I started to get to know Deborah and you know, really get a feeling for the kind of meaning that people put into their work in this space, it, it was more and more attractive to me to know that there's a way to apply creativity and storytelling and reaching out to people in a way that can have a real impact. And I'm not a founder. I've only been doing this for three months, so don't ask me any hard questions, because I don't speak tech. Um, but Andrew Grauer, who is my boss, who started Course Hero 13 years ago as a college student at Cornell, saying, you know, I think there is a way to tap into shared learning uh, in a way that can help other people and help myself as a student. And uh, 13, 14 years later, there are about 400 million visits to the site this year. Uh, we crowdsource content. Students and educators put content up on the site and have access to the site, either by subscribing or by uploading content. And it's really the intention is to help students um, when, when they need help and in general in their learning path uh, to have access to study materials, practice materials, and be successful. And the ultimate goal is to help people graduate more confident and prepared. And it's a great vision, um, the combination, in my opinion, of heart and purpose and growth and profitability is just terrific. Yeah. So Taylor, I think you commented uh, that it's hard to get people to change their behaviors, to do things, is one of the big barriers in education. And um, many of these businesses are several years into their missions. Uh, what is it going to take, as, as we look ahead to the next 10 years, just putting a compelling, engaging platform out there 
doesn't necessarily solve uh, our problems. And in the workforce education world that I live in, Josh Burson, who's a, a sort of well-known analyst and commentator on the space, recently said, you know, never before have companies had access to so many great technologies for upskilling their employees. Problem is, they're just not working. It's not making a difference. People aren't using them. They're not really moving the needle. So what do you think needs to happen? What needs to be different in the next decade so that the adoption of technology is a part of what leads to actually uh, changing these outcomes, these important uh, achievement gap, graduation, uh, skills gap kinds of outcomes. Yeah. Um, I think it really goes down to looking what are people doing already throughout their day? What is the least frictionless path possible to get them to actually start engaging and learning? I mean, this morning we were talking about AI around notifications. Like, you can get all the push notifications in the world, right, to get into the funnel, but if you're not actually doing it and doing it consistently, it's still not, it's just gonna be annoying on your phone. Um, so what are these behaviors? And Toucan, so we're actually, our first product vertical is a Chrome extension. So you plug it into your browser, and then as you're browsing the web on TechCrunch or Reddit or binge watching Netflix, we serve you up with these micro moments of learning. And so I think, Browsing the web is a really interesting vertical. Like, what does audio look like with the world of us walking around with AirPods all the time? Um, what does layering on top of apps instead of creating your own app look like? Um, an SDK API. Um, and also, what does it look like in the physical world where you could, anyone could do some kind of partnership with, say, Google Glass or Snap Spectacles that you're wearing and now you're seeing images or words and it's triggering these micro moments of learning? Like that's really interesting for my perspective. And I'll, I think once, especially us as f first movers with Toucan, once we start seeing that it's actually working and we're proving out the efficacy of it, I think there's a lot more people that are gonna start taking notice. Yeah. John or Krishna, any thoughts about uh, you know other things besides the platform, business models, partnerships? Sure, I think, um, <clears throat> I always think of innovation as like almost going like starting by going backwards. So I think there's been a lot of good discussion today about getting all the stakeholders involved. Um, so as we're kind of imagining what is the future of arts education look like, what does technology look like in the classroom, how does it look like with students and, and teachers, the first thing we go back to is talking to teachers, going into the classrooms and watching how students and teachers are interacting. Um, I think that's the best way to continue to learn and innovate and to create the next generation of learning, especially, especially with uh, technology. I think a lot of companies trying to think about and create what they think is the perfect solution um, and then roll that out and that can be either successful or it can fail. Um, and a lot of times I think in ed tech you can see more failure, failures that way because classes and teachers and students are so nuanced. Every teacher learns differently, every student learns differently. In a classroom you have maybe 30 different you know, people who learn in different ways. Um, so for me I think it starts by going back to kind of like the old school techniques of you know, getting on the phone with teachers, going into classrooms, talking with teachers, and then really using that information to almost like reimagine what's happening today and how technology can be, can be helpful. I think to me that's the idea of, of modern learning is technology can make access um, greater for students, it can make things more affordable, people can learn when they're not even thinking that they're learning. Um, anyone can learn to code or do you know, things that were traditionally either more expensive um, or didn't have as much access. But I think to successfully roll them out, you almost have to go back to, there's nothing that replaces sitting in a classroom, watching a teacher engage with students, doing that thousands of times or as quickly as you can, um, and innovating that way. Yeah. Krishna, you already have millions of students uh, learning to code uh, on your platform. That could grow in the future, but uh, do, you, do you have other types of goals, other um, measures of success um, that might go beyond that? I think uh, for us, the success is about making what kids, uh, students make. Ultimately, you know, it's a tool, so they have to put it to use. So we tend to kind of focus on that portfolios that they're building. And a lot of learnings that we have is like, you know, it's very interesting where how kids tend to learn different things. Like for example, we have hundreds of thousands of projects on pets. 
I mean, nobody knows like pets and coding, like you know, if you're a second grader, and that's the incentive for them to learn to code, right? And I, you know, we, every week we see you know, a quarter million products created by kids. And what we're trying to see is that what motivates them you know, to, to learn and also how they can put it to use on their other learning. They're learning lots of other subjects, math, science, language arts, and all that stuff. So we tend to kind of focus on that. You know, can it be that creative medium where they're putting it to use? And so our goal is ultimately is like, can we build a portfolio-based learning? Like if they were to apply for a high school or a college, do they have a portfolio that they can showcase? This is, a, this is my learning. This is how I can, you know, I've learned computational literacy. And that, that's kind of where we're going. Yeah. Harriet, I know you're only three months into the into nice. Course Hero and uh, <laughs> the EdTech world, but um, is the the business of education technology, the, the mission orientation, is it what you expected? Uh, does it feel different from media marketing, or is there are oh, more totally. similarities? Well, I would say the thing that's so striking to me is that um, there's so many great stories of individuals who are doing really heroic things, who are, you know, they're the people that these everybody in this room cares about. and. Um, I think there's a lot of technology that loses sight of storytelling, but when you can share people's stories so that everybody on a platform like Course Hero says, hey, this, these people are like me. Uh, you know, this is a place where I'm seen and I'm understood and I'm supported and celebrated. You know, that you start to add some more value to just the transactional nature of what a lot of ed tech might be. Um, to me, there's a great opportunity to add that level of heart and humanity that is so clear in, in what everybody's intention is by being in this room. Yeah, that's great. So we're going to open up to questions in about two minutes. But maybe just before we do that, um, could kind of go down the panel here. And if you think ahead to the next 10 years, uh, so we'll be gathering 10 years from now, the 2030 GSV leaders meeting in I don't know, Rio, Michael. <laughs> uh, and uh, what specific or reasonably specific things do you think need to happen for some of these big audacious goals that we had 10 years ago that we've made relatively little progress against, that that could be a really different kind of story, uh, whether it's in your space or elsewhere in ed tech. Uh, we'll start with John and go down the low line. Sure. Um, so I think it's, it's really cool to be here to see, um, we talked about sort of in the presentation the whack-a-mole problem. Um, as I've sort of learned and studied uh, K-12 and talked to so many teachers, there are so many issues or problems or opportunities. Um, and I think it's, I always take the perspective that as a company or as an entrepreneur um, or as a teacher, um, you don't necessarily have to solve all of them. You can focus on one thing that you think you can do really well that helps the bigger problem, um, but it does take a lot of people sort of focusing on each of the moles, potentially. Um, so I think for, for us, or the way I look at it is kind of really focusing on what's really important and what can you solve and what problems and solutions can you bring to the table, but also doing that in a very collaborative way, partnering with other organizations. And especially in, in K-12, I think it's been great to see a lot of organizations or governments being open to um, partnering, especially within the arts, because it's been something that's, I think, underserved, as we all know, for, um, for decades, for, for a really long time. Um, but I think the collaboration and everyone sort of focusing on how can I improve the system individually or within my organization, but also doing that across um, different organizations as well. I think that'll really help drive even more change. I think there have been a lot of uh, discussions on panels the last two days where those interfaces between state, federal, and local government, public-private partnerships, uh, that that's really where you can start to get some real traction. Yeah. Taylor? Yeah. I think this concept around invisible learning is super interesting. Like, personally, I think Google is the best teacher. I used YouTube to actually te teach myself how to code. Um, the content exists. There's so many amazing ed tech companies. But how do we get people to learn when they're not really realizing that they're actually doing it, whether through games and coding or whatnot? So I think that will be a really interesting shift and perspective to see in these next 10 years and also see the impact of that. Like, does it actually move the needle? Great. Krishna? I can only narrowly speak to its uh, computing. I think uh, to, you know, policy is one thing. Lots of governments are acting, saying it's a mandatory thing from K to 12. 
A lot of thought leadership is happening in schools and districts as well, which is, I think, is very super important for preparing the kids. Um, I think uh, if there is, you know, there's lots of skill gaps, looks like, but one tech skill gaps can be closed out if they start early and kind of, you know, introduce themselves, introduce kids in, in, a, in a meaningful way. Yeah. A little unfair, three months in, but how about you, Harriet? Well, from my limited perspective, at least when I look at what we're doing and listen a little bit to the AI conversations and machine learning as technology advances and those kinds of mechanisms get more intuitive, uh, you know, I would hope and, and believe that the organic richness of the experience gets deeper. Um, and that sort of creates a more comfortable place for people to be, um, you know, sort of to your point about invisible learning, so that it's more organic and just kind of a natural relationship. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks very much. We'll open it up now for questions for our panelists. Oh, and actually, let me introduce our whips. Uh, so, uh, Julie and Vishal, actually, if you'll introduce yourselves, and then we can start passing uh, the mic around. Great, I'm Julie Hansen. I'm the US CEO of Babbel, which is the leading um, paid subscription language learning app in the world, 13-year-old at tech company based in Berlin, and I run the US operations. Um, I'm going to probably drone on for a while. So uh, <laughs> my name is Vish. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Sophia. Um, I, uh, I actually didn't know what a whip was uh, so before I came here. So I was like, OK. So I. I Exactly, because I'm Canadian. So I, I like packed <laughs> my entire leather outfit, <laughs> <laughs> including including the pants, and uh, and I had to try them on first. And and then me and my co-founder Emma over there, we were like, okay, maybe we should just Google this and look this up. We looked it up, and now I have a lot more room in my luggage. So uh, so that's good. <laughs> so um, I, I guess I'll, I'll quickly tell you about the company, and and then I'll turn it over to you. So. Um, we are a data science company developing at Harvard, um, and we kind of think of ourselves as the Spotify of education, that's what we call ourselves. So you think about how Spotify works and how it's like revolutionized music search, right? Like a few years ago, most people in this room used to spend like hours every week on YouTube ripping music, sorry for whoever works at Google here, but that's what happens. And um, we would then put it on our iPod and like we'd have to do that every week, right? And it was like the worst process. And then Spotify came along and helped with all of its data science magic. And so we do a really similar thing for online learners uh, or employees and companies. And so um, with Sophia, what happens is a student or a learner comes onto our platform and they tell us who they are, what level they are, and what outcome they want to achieve. I'm in grade six and I want to be a doctor or an engineer or, I'm sorry, a lawyer maybe. Um, I wouldn't, but anyway. Um, and we basically look into our pool of always updating data, right? We have these streams of data coming in of students who have sort of completed these outcomes. And then we can like hot assemble learning paths for the students that get them all the way from point A to point B. So for us, it's like a good way to use data science for learning. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break the rules a little bit again. And I'm going to make a comment to the, um, the student debt panel. And then I'm going to ask you guys a question. And uh, I hope that's OK. Um, so my comment is, um, I think what you guys are really working, working on is really, really important. When I was in graduate school, I, I ran out of tuition money. And I had to make a decision whether I'm going to pay my rent or pay my tuition. And so I took all of my rent money, after thinking about it for a long time, I was living alone, took all of my rent money, and I paid my tuition. And so I had to move out, and I lived in a 24-hour McDonald's for two weeks. And I learned three really important lessons there. This is maybe six years, seven years ago. One was that waking up at four in the morning in a booth in McDonald's and being able to get ice cream with like chocolate dressing and Oreos, it's the best thing ever. So everyone should experience that. Um, the second thing is that, I mean, it was the best decision I ever made in my life to, even though it was hard, to, to to finish my degree, that's, that was evidently really important. And the third thing is that I learned a lot about financial literacy. So I hope that as you guys are building your companies and doing your thing, um, you're really taking the opportunity that you have to teach young people the value of financial literacy, because that serves them, that will serve them really, really well. Now my, my comment for you guys, question for you guys is, um, you know, it's really around soft skills and its importance in modern learning. And so my, my hobby is that I'm an emergency doctor. And you know all the patients that I see, they don't give a shit if I'm good at math or stats or physics or chemistry, right? 
like really all they ever care about is that I listened to them and that I nodded and that you know if I'm dealing with an 85 year old woman who needs amoxicillin I'm not just going to give her one tablet and then send her home with a script I'm going to figure out a way to give her the whole box right so all these little flexibility things so I think that these soft skills are the things that are the centerpiece of modern learning because they're what differentiate us from the machines right and so to what extent do you guys think that teaching or enabling soft skill acquisition is a core part of what you do and what you will do. Yeah. I'll go ahead and start and then um, turn it over to whoever wants to uh, come in from the panel. I, I would agree with the thesis that with where we are with education technology platforms today, they've been much more effective in producing strong learning outcomes with kind of individually obtained um, harder skills, whether it's coding skills or technical skills, um, than they have been with softer skills. However, I think that is changing quickly, and I'm really excited about the next decade and the ability of interactive learning platforms to really deliver on the promise of achieving skills in collaboration, critical thinking, um, influencing others, the things that employers complain about, that they're younger employees in particular aren't bringing into the workplace uh, for them and that's holding people back. So I, I would agree with that premise, but I, I do think that that's starting to change. Yeah, John. Yeah, I'd love to go. Um, I think this is one of the benefits of the arts is um, it really does teach a lot of the soft skills. I think it's um, a place where kids, um, they come in, they want to express themselves, they're vulnerable, and the teachers, the best arts teachers, and I think the best teachers in general, do a really good job of teaching the soft skills, uh, and the arts is just a great vehicle for that, because it's a little bit different than some of the other, um, let's say, STEM-based uh, subjects. So I think a lot of what we do um, in our program, and I think it's just important probably for any subject, is when we start with teachers, it's helping them teach more effectively. And we'll do courses on like you know the psychology of students, right? Not just the dance and the theater and the music skills, but helping every teacher, whether it's an arts teacher or a math teacher, um, help students learn and develop those um, those softer skills. I think is super important, and we've taken that as like a really personal mission. I consider that to be just as important as you know, teaching ballet and bar work or center work or hip hop dance or, you know, directing, um, teaching kids to be emotional, to be expressive, to be collaborative is probably just as important. It's almost like another art form that we're, that we're teaching, but you can teach it in, in anything. Um, and I think the arts is great for that because it's set up in a way, the classes are, um, it's just really, it's easier to teach that kind of emotional um, or social emotional learning um, in those skills. But I would, I would say I think you can do it in, in everything. Anytime there are a teacher and students in a classroom, wherever it is, K-12, higher ed, there's that opportunity. Um, so I think it's, it's important for us as we're building our platforms to really take that um, on ourselves to make sure we incorporate that type of learning uh, to the extent that you can um, and not sort of you know, push it off to, to somebody else to solve that problem, because I think it has to happen in every classroom. And that's where you'll see, like, the best outcomes for, for kids, I think. Yeah. All right. Julie, you, any questions, or should yeah, we? I do have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, to oversimplify, on this panel, you have four companies built on really different learning methodologies. You've got video based, internet browsing based, again, I'm oversimplifying, game based. Why? Is that your personalities? Is that the subject matter you're teaching? Is that how, is, do we need that many diverse ways that people learn? Like, why are your companies so different from each other? I mean, I think, um, I'll, I'll speak myself, like, if you ask a child, and what do you want to do? They would uh, give you a different answer. I want to mod Minecraft, I want to uh, do goopy meme, or something else. So if you meet them there, and uh, then you end up building different things. Like, for example, they won't tell me that I want to detect a prime number, right? Like, you know, <laughs> that's not what you hear, or at least common multiple. But you can, you know, you can create those pathways if you are listening to what, like, for example, one experiment we've done is we, uh, two summers back, we bought a bunch of kids, and my kids were into Minecraft. There are 80 million kids play Minecraft every week. So we asked them a series of questions, what do you want to do in Minecraft? And they've given us like 25 things they wanted to do. And then we said, how does it inter intersect with computing? And we found out three things. And we built only those three things for them. 
we have like 25 million assets get built in two years, right? But that's meeting them there, and you have to gamify because they want to do that. And through that, can we teach some computing? Sure. And, and that's hence how we built it. I think what you're really talking about is meeting people where they are. And I think different platforms come from meeting different kinds of people where they are. So for us, if you know, most, of, most students are many, many, as we all know, are studying at 3 o'clock in the morning because they're working two or three jobs or what have you. Um, so to have those kinds of resources available solves a different kind of problem. And, and that's the result, results in a different kind of platform. All right. Let's go to uh, any other questions from the audience. I have one. Yeah. Um, Krishna, I want to ask you, you're the wizened veteran on the stage. Um, you're sort of over, over a decade into building an ed tech company, having come from you know, hard technology right, into ed tech. Um, what would you do differently um, today if you'd known, you know, known what you know now um, over a decade ago when you started Tinker? Um, I think that if you look at company goals, you have one end is like you know, your user goals and revenue goals. And, and I would think about, in the last six years, uh, thinking about revenue scaling differently. Uh, and in, you know, what would make a, a school or a parent pay? Because if you were to build a large, you know, we could build companies that are like you know, single digit hits and nobody cares. But if you really want to set a trend in that tech, you need to really go take companies big scale. So I would think about, as an entrepreneur, like either those goals set up up front and see how that scaling happens. And I think ed tech requires a lot of persistence, um, from what I've uh, learned. The kind of traffic we have, if I have a consumer company, I'd be completely differently valued. Uh, so that's, 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 that's what I would uh, look at it. And, and I also think it's like three times, you know, every time you build a regular company to ed tech company, is three times more time you have to think mentally. Like if you were to like build a company in six years, you have to think about 12-year timelines here. Hmm. Yes, over here. Uh, Boris Saxberg with CZI. I I'm curious, maybe even from each of you, um, how do you plan to measure your success? That is, you may be able to sell without measuring success, which is always exciting. But how do you plan to measure the efficacy? Uh, Taylor, I think you even mentioned this, that I gotta figure out whether it works and yeah. that kind of thing. But I'm just curious across the very different things you're doing, what, what will you look for to say we are having the measurable difference on students that we intend? I mean, the efficacy piece to me is super important. Uh, one of the tech companies I had worked at was Headspace. We were the first meditation out there, and we had a science team in like actually testing the efficacy of this. Um, and that transfers over to us for what we're building with Toucan. Like, we can serve up these micro moments of learning, but are people actually learning through this method? And can we prove that they're retaining this information for the long term also? But what's cool about what we're building is we can inject anything we want into the browser so we can show you these learnings and then ask you questions. So we get feedback and input, and that actually feeds our back end too of when to serve you up the content next using space, space repetition. Um, so that piece is key for us. We are super early, we're seven months in, um, so we still have like to prove it out, but we think that we're on the right track to do that. Anyone else on how you're gonna um, measure success? Uh, I for us, we built that very early on. One thing about testing is really hard is it stresses kids out. Like, you know, you give them tests. So what we do is um, from, like, minute they land on to this thing, we give them series of games and puzzles, and we measure exactly how they're solving, how many hints have they taken, you know. So if you ask me, given a child, I can tell you exactly how they learned loops, what pathway they went down to the loops, or conditional logic. Uh, so that's very critical to proving that there's an outcome. And obviously those are our computing outcomes, but the higher level outcomes, like I can do storytelling or game making or like design thinking, those kind of things we actually measure over time. And by categorizing what they're making, and then also analyzing it with like uh, cohorts of kids that, that are making through. So schools like our product because you click on any student, it'll give you a complete history of how they've learned through and what they've learned. 
and that's how kind of they pay for our product, I guess. John, teaching the arts, um, challenging to perhaps assess uh, outcomes. How do, you, how do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's interesting because it's, the arts, in most cases, are really subjective. Um, so what I, the approach that we've taken is to start to talk to people first who have done this and studied this for 10, 20, 30 um, plus years. Because um, I think it's it's great to pool lots of resources in. Um, and the second thing we've done is started to talk to schools, teachers, districts, states. Um, California, we're actually in a program working with them on. Um, they have specific goals for arts, media, and entertainment. It's a big part of their um, their economy. So it's really important that that drives through K-12. So a really cool opportunity for us to work on that with them to help drive what are the outcomes that are most important to you. I think what I've also found within the arts is. It, it's least about the technical skills within the arts. You can measure that, and for dance, you can sort of assess whether somebody's better or you know worse per se. Um, but I think is someone creative is a really tough problem to test for, and you generally don't see it sometimes until later in life. Somebody can be in their fifties, really, really creative, and start a company, whereas you know that creativity really started as a kid. So I think we've tried to do this in a very collaborative way. Um, but also there might be 10, 20, 30 plus different things that are important for creative learning. Um, and I think it's, it, you know, for us that's the challenge of really defining so that it's narrow enough, but also that it's broad enough so different states or different schools or different teachers might um, look at it differently. And how can we make sure we're collecting all the information and data, sharing that <clears throat> so that we're helping drive creativity um, you know, both in the U.S. internationally, um, so it's a really interesting problem. I think it goes back to just doing things in a very collaborative way, um, getting lots of input, and then sort of defining from there, um, but not pretending like we know how to measure creativity because I think not maybe nobody does. You know, it's really it's it's tough, but a really cool challenge for us. Yeah. All right. Well, please join me in both thanking our panelists and wishing them the best uh, in Thank the future. You.